Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Take your Bibles this morning, your phones, your iPads, whatever means you have to get to the Word of God, and let's turn to Psalm 115. A few weeks ago, I dealt with a message entitled, Who Are You Going to Call? Today, we're going to ask, ask the question, why are you going to call? And so here we see something as we look at this. Psalm 115, the psalmist says, if you're there, say amen, by the way. Amen. Psalm 115, the psalmist says, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. So the psalmist begins here by establishing that there's something that preeminently belongs exclusively to God. It's called glory. The glory is his. So we have to understand this word glory because there are a few different definitions of glory. Glory can mean beautiful. It can be distinctive. Glory can even mean pride. In Proverbs chapter 16, it says that gray hair is a crown of glory. Now, would you turn to somebody next to you <laughs> as it is applicable and say, why are you hiding the glory? <laughs> Don't see me after service. See that person. But there are two distinctive references that I want to deal with as we look at this issue of glory. One is glory, glory to God, and the other is the glory of God. We see these two references throughout the Bible, the glory of God and glory to God. So what is the glory of God? The glory of God is the manifestation of the weight and value of his presence. The manifestation of the weight and the value of his presence. See, we think about value, if, if I would say, if you had some gold in your hand, we would say That's, that has value, but we don't know how much value it has until we weigh it. Well, God has preeminent, without exception, the highest level of value because he weighs the most. Now, you see this when you see Isaiah. Isaiah goes before God in the presence of God, and it says the train of his robe fills the temple. He's in the midst of the glory of God. And while he's there, he says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. What happens? He begins to realize how much God weighs and how much he doesn't weigh. See, you, when, when you stand in the midst of glory, it begins to affect your perception of things. Is it any wonder when you see in the Bible the issue of the manifestation of the glory of God, and sometimes it's referred to as Shekinah, is that that glory expression, we see that people find themselves not even able to either penetrate it or stand in the presence of the glory of God. It's so great. And yet Jesus is the walking, talking, living manifestation of the glory of God on earth. For it says, and we saw his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus revealed the value and the greatness of God Almighty. So there is the glory of God. But then glory to God is our acknowledgement and response to his greatness, to his value. So when we give God glory to God, think about it as we maybe offer a praise or worship him, we give him glory. We are not adding, we are not an increasing his existing glory. We are acknowledging his glory. 
He already possesses glory. He's great and glorious. He possesses weight. What we're doing now is acknowledging that weight, that glory, that value with our lips, with our lifestyle, with our choices, with our daily decisions. That's why the Bible says this. It says, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do to the glory of God. Everything is to be done for and to the glory of God Almighty. So the psalmist says, not to us, O Lord, not to us. We don't get the glory. The glory doesn't become ultimately ours. It's the glory of God. We exist to glorify him. And he says, there are two things that anchor our responsiveness to God. There are two things that usher us into a place of giving him glory. One, because of his loving kindness and because of his truth. That word loving kindness is a covenantal word. In the original language of the Old Testament, it's the word hasid. That word hasid could be translated a few ways. Loving kindness, steadfast love, grace, mercy, faithfulness, goodness, and devotion. So God walks in and manifests loving kindness toward those he is in covenant with. Did you know we are the covenant people of God? Amen. Covenant, we are in agreement with God. And a covenant speaks of that which requires mutual agreement and mutual expectation. Did you know that when you get married, you enter into a covenant? I said, did you know when you get married, you enter into a covenant? You come into a place of agreement with mutual expectations? I would hope there are expectations. You would expect the husband to do his role as a husband. That was two ladies who said yes. <laughs> you would expect the wife to do her role as a wife in that relationship. Okay, if you don't know what those are, they're right here. <laughs> there are expectations biblically for the husband and for the wife. And so we should expect, the husband should love his wife as Christ loved the church. You should have an expect expectation for that if you are a wife, that that husband will love me the way Christ loved the church and laid down his life for that church. Help us, Lord. <laughs> I mean, when covenant is about really understanding the significance of love, love, a, a commitment to love. And so God loves us with a covenantal love. He is committed to us. He is committed to being faithful to us. He's committed to being good to us. He's committed to being devoted to us. God loves us. Oh, the love of God the love that he has for us, that we should be called the children of God. He loves us. And he's consistently manifesting that love toward us. Covenant. The second thing he says is because of truth. Did you know God is fixed within the framework of truth? God cannot veer outside of truth. God has established himself in truth. Therefore, understand, the Bible says it's impossible for God to even lie. The book of Numbers said that God, God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, he will bring it to pass. So God is, is true and God indeed is committed to the truth. And the platform for loving kindness is truth. The foundation for loving kindness is truth. What does that mean? That God can only love you according to the truth. See, anytime you take truth out of love, it stops being love. I'm going to say it this way. Let's think about in a relationship. If you're in a relationship, a dating relationship, and someone says, I love you. Well, if truth is not in that relationship, that that relationship is not manifest in that relationship. Although they say they love you, they don't love you. Because when you take truth out of love, all you have less left is lust. <laughs> love never takes you anywhere outside of the truth. If you love someone, you want the best for them. 
If you love someone, you will uphold them. You will value them. If you love someone, you're committed to their well-being. You will c- make sure that the, you, they are aligned with the will of God. So I cannot say I love someone in a dating relationship and then try to bed down with them. That would dishonor the truth. Pastor, I think that is powerful. <laughs> that is that is life changing. Boy, I woo! I could run around this church. <laughs> How insightful. Well, maybe there is another issue we're going to get to in a moment. In verse 2, we discover that the psalmist, as he's making these powerful declarations, not to us, not to us, O oh Lord, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness and your truth. That the psalmist is making this declaration either in the midst or response to those who are taunting him or taunting the reality of the existence and greatness and power of God. For they ask the question, why should the nation say, where now is their God? But our God is in heavens, in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. So where now is your God? There would be those who would question the existence of God, the relevance of God, the importance of you placing your trust in God Almighty. And isn't it interesting, sometimes when you come at a place where you make that outstanding declaration about the goodness of God, your belief in God, your standing with God, don't be surprised when there's a contrary voice that comes up that will try to undermine your ability to be faithful to what you just declared. That God is good. That God is faithful. Then there are voices that say, why are you trusting God? Why are you believing God? Especially when you're going through something. Don't think there won't be contrary voices, external voices and sometimes internal voices that will try to undermine the ability to keep going forward in your faith in God. And here, the psalmist responds to the spirit of the nations that are in opposition to Israel who question and want to doubt the existence of God. He says, okay, let me tell you where, I, where our God is. God is in the heavens, and he does whatever he pleases. Now, what he's doing, he's not simply giving God's home address, but what he's doing is saying this. Not only does God exist, God is above all existence. He's above everything that exists. So everything you, exi- everything you see exists because of him. He is above it all. Nothing came into existence apart from him. So understand, he is above. He is up there. He's beyond everything. Matter of fact, it says in Psalm 113, in verse, in verse 4, the Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? who is enthroned on high. So he's above everything. So if God is above everything, is it hard to believe he knows everything and that he can do everything? So he has that imminent position above it all, and he can do whatever he pleases. That means time, space, circumstances, issues, things that come up. Nothing has the ability to restrict God and his ability to do whatever he needs to do on your behalf. God can do it. God is not restricted. He is free to be himself because there's nothing that can hold him back. He does whatever he pleases. Now I know we think about he does whatever he pleases, that God can turn things around that we thought could never be turned around. That God can adjust things that we thought could never be adjusted. That God remembers things we thought he may have forgotten. But God is able to bring to the surface the things that need to be manifested so we can fulfill our destiny. But if he can do whatever he pleases, then he has the ability to sometimes move slower than we want him to. Right? We want God to move like, come on, get, come on, Lord, get it done now. And God, God, just like we saw in the ministry of Jesus, in the earthly ministry of Jesus, Jesus did not run anywhere. He was always walking. Where are you going? Galilee. We're just walking to Galilee. 
There's some water. Walking on the water. He never ran anywhere. He was every step was in the perfect timetable of God. And so we understand there are times that God may move slower than we would expect. But I want to tell you, every step of God is the perfect timing for your life. You ever been in a place where you've just been waiting and waiting and waiting and praying and crying and waiting? And then the manifestation came. And you look back and you realize that was the perfect time. That was the perfect time. I wasn't ready for it if it happened earlier. I would have misjudged it. I may have missed it. I, this was the perfect timetable. See, God knows what he's doing. I'm going to say it again. God knows what he's doing. So he says that our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Now, he's established something about the reality. God exists, and he's above all creation and everything that exists. But then he draws a line of demarcation between God and what the nations worship. Look what he says here in verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. So here he's saying, understand, we're talking about the greatness, the glory of God Almighty, and then... He turns and says, now, you are rejecting the, the relevance, the presence, the existence of God in my life. Let's look at what you worship. Let's look at what is a priority to you. Because understand that even though man may reject God, that doesn't mean he stops being a worshiper. The atheist is a worshiper. The agnostic who doesn't know, don't want to be identified as a believer or unbeliever, he is still a worshiper. We see in Romans chapter 1, it says that they exchanged the truth for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. See, all they did was redirect their worship from God to something else. And we live in a society, and it's not a new experience, it's not a new reality, that we still see the prominent presence of worship permeating our land. It's not directed, may not be directed at God, but we still see worship existing. Whether you're worshiping science, worshiping technology, worshiping social media, because really, what is it? An idol is the very thing that has the ability to influence your thoughts, your behavior, and your actions. And so what happens if, if you are absorbed in that, you give into that, that becomes an area of idol, an idol in your life, an idolatrous presence, especially when it has more influence in your life than God. And so he's, we're seeing here, he says, now look at these things. You, you worship, he says, they have eyes, but they don't see. They, 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 they have ears. You can cry out to them, but they can't hear you. The, that they have feet, but they can't run to your aid. They can't walk. They, they're the image of something that seemingly is for you, but it can't do anything for you. And yet we put our trust in these things. Yes, we get absorbed in these things. Charles Swindoll said this, it's easy to get attached to idols, good things inappropriately adorned, but when you have Jesus in the center of a room, everything else Everything else only junks up the decor. Is Jesus at the center of the room? Because you don't need all the other stuff to influence you, to direct you, to establish your identity and how you function. In 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul is speaking to the saints in Thessalonica, and he's celebrating a change that had occurred in their life. First Thessalonians chapter 1, and it says this in verse 9. It says, For they themselves report about us 
what kind of reception we have had with you and how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. How you turn from idols. See, you cannot really have a impactful, relevant, significant relationship with God and still hold on to idols. You got to let the idols go. You got to let the idols go. So what happens? We come into the kingdom of God. We receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. At Lord, that means he's above all else, that he's the God who's above the heavens. He's Lord. He's, he has sovereign control. That's what we declare about him when we receive him, not just as Savior, but as Lord. But then in the course of our life, we can get distracted by things that happen, and we can develop attachments again to things that we were once dependent upon. Anybody ever had a relationship that ended and and you had moved on, then all of a sudden you get a call, <laughs> maybe years later, and please don't go on Facebook, they'll find you. <laughs> and, you and all of a sudden, if you're not careful, memories will come back. And when memories come back, feelings will come back. Oh yeah, y'all get happy now. <laughs> <laughs> and all those things can happen when you open that door. See, there can be attachments, there can be idle attachments in your life that if you allow yourself to go back, think about it, begin to uh, allow your mind to go there, you can begin to reconnect with those things and the emotions of those things. That's why it's interesting how when the face of, in the face of a crisis or a difficult situation, how do you respond? Do you respond in trust in God, or do you revert back to idols? You know how somebody goes through a situation, and they've been walking with the Lord, trusting God, being faithful, and then they hit a crisis, and it seems to be bigger than them, at least from their perspective. And what do they do? I got to go get a drink. <laughs> I, I, I got I to get a buzz. I gotta, this is messing me up. What's happening? What happened? They're going back to other influences. The influences they had released when they came into the kingdom, they had to go back to. When they, when they were trusting God and believing God, all of a sudden they, they had a feeling of loneliness. Well, wait a minute. Who is like the Lord? No one. Oh, uh, well, no one, but right now I need someone <laughs> physical. And what happens? They go back to that other realm of idolatry. I want to go back, if you will, to the book of Colossians, because I think sometimes we reduce idolatry to little images with carved faces and carved out hands and carved out feet that can't walk. But the New Testament enlarges the scope of what indeed is idolatry. And he provides us an insight and a warning. Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to give you a moment to get there. I was talking to someone recently. And uh, they said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of new to this and trying to navigate around the Bible. And they said, Pastor, you get up and you say, turn to the book of Proverbs. And I go, okay, okay Proverbs, where? Got to find Proverbs. And, I was, and he said, and then it was, he said, Pastor, and then one time you did that, you said, turn to Proverbs. He said, you said it was right next to the book of Psalms. I'm going, Psalms? Where's Psalms? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to give you a moment to get, because I want you to see this. But Colossians chapter 3, and it says in verse 1, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, ask somebody, have you been raised up with Christ? <laughs> See, if you have come into the kingdom, if you've been born from above, if you are alive in Jesus, you've been raised up. That's the beauty of the imagery of baptism, that when you come in Christ, you've been buried the old man is laid to rest. A new man is raised up. <laughs> Baptism indeed is an open declaration of what has happened internally in the spirit. And so here we see, it says, if you've been raised up with Christ, look at this, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Here is one of the problems. One of the problems is we come into the kingdom, we receive Christ, but we stop seeking. We stop seeking as if to say, because I have given my life to him, I, because I, I come to know him, 
that's all I got, that's all I need, I'm, I'm all right now. How many know if you're going to have a relationship, a relationship has to be cultivated? How many have been married about five years? How about 10 years? 15 years? 20 years? 25 years? 30 years? The hands are going up slower. <laughs> How many know the fact is, if you've got a healthy marriage where you still talk to each other, <laughs> you've discovered something. you got to keep seeking. you got to keep investing yourself. Now, you've seen the, the image of, a, of a, a marriage that indeed is dysfunctional where people are just together, but they don't talk. They don't laugh together. They can't experience joy together. They're just existing because they stop seeking each other. Because understand, a relationship is about learning that person. And know, you want to know something? This is really interesting. Is that we change. We change. I've discovered about myself there are things I didn't like that I now like. And there are things I didn't have interest in now I have interest in. So if you're not seeking me, you're going to say... All these years, and I don't know you. What is you got to you got to what you got to continue to seek that person. You're growing in the relationship. How many know that's happening to us, right? Yes. Are you changing? Yes. Amen. We we pray that's good, right? We're changing for the. <laughs> Amen. And so, when it comes to the Lord, the Lord doesn't change. But you can't grasp him all in one day, one year, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, a lifetime. You still will not be able to grasp the fullness of the scope of who he is. So you've got to seek him and keep on seeking him. You know, we talk about this idea of running after God. Why would I have to run after him if I already have him? Because I need to come into a place where I'm continually to pursue a deeper level in him. To come to a place where I'm trying to know him better each day. That's how I grow. That's how I develop. That's how I get beyond where I am. That's how I become stagnant. And so what happens, there are Christians now who become stagnant because they stop seeking. They're just going through the, ro the, ro the rotation, <laughs> motions, the activity, and all the stuff you're thinking. <laughs> and so they go through the motions, and, and they become, in essence, religious without a vibrancy without a fire for God. And so now they become weak and they get distracted and they go on that roller coaster and they lose their zeal, they lose their passion. And he says, keep seeking. Verse two, set your mind on the things above and not the things that are on earth. He's not talking about stepping to a realm of, of irresponsibility in life where you don't deal with life matters. He's talking about the priority of your focus, what indeed is allowed to influence you. He says here in verse 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is your life is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. This one phrase, when Christ who is your life. Christ is to be your life. He is not to be reduced to a Sunday morning only experience. Christ is your life. Amen. See, when Christ is your life, you continue to seek him. When Christ is your life, you don't go through changes because we have one day fast a week. Right. <laughs> oh, the church is going to fast for one day a week. And what happens, you can realize, uh-oh, that stronghold of that idolatrous food I mean, no, we can develop a dependency upon food. We eat it all the time. It's natural. It's normal. What is fasting? Going against what's normal to invite what is abnormal, supernatural, to step into a realm of God. And that makes us uncomfortable because we like to eat. <laughs> but what if we could put God above what is normal? If we, could, uh, if we can put him above the appetite with food, maybe we can put them above other appetites. 
and break strongholds. He must be our life. He is not a portion of life, our life, not an aspect in our life. He must be our life. Everything must be centered in him. And then he says, therefore, verse 5, everything is built. He's built, uh, laid a foundation now. He's building. And he says, therefore, consider the members of your earthly body. You know what the members of your earthly body are. And your arms, your legs, every part, your, everything, your, your body. Consider the members of your earthly body as dead, dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Wow. So if I'm engaged in these kind of activities, I am engaged in an idolatrous practice. If I'm if I'm looking at pornography, I'm engaged in an idolatrous practice. If I'm engaged in premarital or extramarital sex, I'm engaged in an idolatrous practice. If I begin to put things above people and run after money beyond the priority of God, I'm involved in an idolatrous practice. See, God has a plan for us. And we have to pull down every stronghold of idolatry so we can walk in the fullness of the plan that God has for us. Back in Psalm 115, it just says this in verse 9, O Israel, trust in the Lord, for he is their help and their shield. Turn to his mind and say, O oh, who you are. <laughs> Whoever you are, I may not know your name. Oh, hey, oh, buddy, oh. <laughs> trust in the Lord. Hallelujah. Trust in the Lord. Tell him, trust in the Lord. Glory. Trust. Hallelujah. Trust in the Lord. 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 He is their help and their shield. Trust in the Lord. He will help you. He will cover you. He will protect you. He will shield you. Trust in the Lord. Now, when we talk about trust, we're not talking simply about, simply about belief. Because I can believe something about God. Trust is when I put the weight of my actions on what I believe. That's when I begin to walk out my faith every day. That's trust. To trust him. Trust the Lord and watch him show up and provide help for you. Watch him show up and protect you and be a shield around you. Trust him and watch him do. See, now here's the challenge, right? Because the Lord can do whatever he pleases, he may be moving slow from your perspective. And so now that's when trust is going to really be tested. Because the, the Lord may be moving really slow. From his perspective, he's normal. From our perspective, it's slow. And trust is now being put to the test. And it's at those moments we have to stand and say, I'm believing you. Despite what I see, I'm believing you. Despite what I'm going through, I'm believing you. Despite my temptations, I'm believing you. Despite my fears, I'm believing you. Despite the concern, I'm believing you. Despite the challenges of the moment, I'm believing you. Despite the grief, I'm believing you. Despite the sickness, I'm believing you. Despite the scarcity in my life, I'm believing you. I'm believing I'm going to keep on walking with you because I know you are a covenant-keeping God. You possess and will manifest on me loving kindness, steadfast love, faithfulness, goodness. You are a good God, and you're going to reveal yourself. I just need to be able to keep on standing in the reality of who you are. And you possess the greatest weight. 
Why would I try to invest myself in something that has no value when I can wait on the one who has all value? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you know, like I know, and you know like I know, that if you go through the process of idolatry, you'll find out that you had a cheap imitation that left you worse after the experience than before. Do something with me. Stand with me. Because our God is so awesome, so great, so powerful, so wonderful. That we need to understand and entrust ourselves to him. Trust him and entrust ourselves to him. Tell somebody, God is not finished with you. God's not finished with you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't you dare contemplate getting, giving up. God's not finished with you. Don't you even think for a moment to be passive when God has an aggressive plan for your life. And think about it. It says he would give us a lifetime of favor. That he would open doors that no man can shut. That he would begin to direct us in ways to fulfill his destiny for our life. Don't dare rely on an idol that becomes a distraction to the purpose and the fulfillment of God in your life. Glory to God. This morning, before we transition, and there's going to be in a moment of a number of gentlemen and women will come down, altar call counselors will come down here to greet you and meet you if you're here and you want to receive Christ in your life as Savior and as Lord to become your life. Or if you're here today and you say, I have a relationship with God, but I've veered far away from him. If you want to restore that relationship with God, they'll be here to meet with you and pray with you and help you to begin to move forward in the things of God. Or maybe you're here today and you say, I'm walking with the Lord, I, but I'm not connected. I don't have a home church where I'm a part and, and be a part of that community of faith and build it up and, and see the purpose of God flow and be manifested through that church to impact and change lives and change families and change the world. I need a, a home church. If that's you, they'll be here to help you begin the process of connection with Crossover Church. But God, God has a great, great, incredible plan. And I just want to take a moment to say, wait a minute, if you're here today, and if you can be honest, turn to somebody and say, be honest with yourself. Turn to somebody else and say, and be honest with God. If you know in your life you've got some idols that are impeding your ability to get where you need to go, can we break that today? The first thing is to acknowledge it. The second thing is to repent from it. The third thing is to, in, to position yourself for the power of God to come upon you. Because I want to believe a new fire. I want to believe a new wind to blow into the sails of your faith. I, I want to believe that you're not going to be content with last year. and I, I want to believe you're going to have a new expectation for what God can do. Hallelujah. And God has an expectation for what you can do. If you're here, you say, yes, Pastor, I... I came in here, and I, I know there are idols, there are things that are in my life, things that have influence in my life, greater influence in some ways than God has. And, you know, the, the simple acid test is not what you believe, it's what you do. If, if you're responding to those things more than you respond to God, 
then they have greater influence. If you say yes to them and say no to God, they have greater influence. Can we take a moment and go before God right now? And maybe you're here and you say, I got to be honest, I, I, I need to have this thing broken off my life. Then just take a moment, come on down to this altar, we can pray together. Hallelujah, worthy, 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 worthy. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. give you a moment to talk to the Lord directly. Confess before him. Acknowledge what you need to acknowledge before him so we can make a turn this morning. confess, we acknowledge, we need to repent. Say, God, I'm turning right now by the power of God. I'm embracing the forgiveness and the goodness of God. Your word says if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us, to cleanse us, to clean the slate. So we declare right now, dear God, a clean slate before you. The palate has been cleaned by the grace and mercy of God. But now, Father, now that we have a clean slate and a clean altar, we want the fire to come. Hallelujah. Just lift your hands where you are right now. We believe in God to bring a fresh fire upon you. Hallelujah. A fresh wind and a fresh fire in this place. Ah, Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your forgiveness this morning, Lord God. We lay, God, everything, God, and we give it, and we will leave it at this altar today, Lord Jesus. Father, we give food to you in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that our appetites, Lord God, will be for you in the name of Jesus. We lay aside, Lord God, our love for sugar in the name of Jesus. For every starchy thing, Lord God, we give it back to you, God. We thank you, Lord God, that you are a keeper in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, Lord God. Holy and righteous, Lord God. Father, we will not give it away, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Lord God, for our thought process, 
us, Lord God. We give it back to you, Lord God. We will think on things that are lovely. We will think on things that are pure, Lord God. Father, we thank you, Lord. Nothing, God, will hold us in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that the word of God says who the Son sets free is free indeed. And we call ourselves today free people in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that we are free. Thank you, Lord, that we choose this day to be free. Hallelujah. We thank you for the renewing of our minds and the renewing of our hearts, Lord. The conditions of our heart, Lord God. We yield it at this altar. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if you're free in this place, get up and worship the Lord your God. Hallelujah. 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 Glory. Ah, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. We bless the name of Jesus with your lips. Bless the name of Jesus in this place. We give him to give him glory with your lips and with your heart and with your life. Choose this day who you will serve. He's a mighty God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we proclaim. Amen.